I am now pleased to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Walter Korschitz. Dr. Korschitz serves as director of the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke. He joined NINDS in 20, 2007 as deputy director and has held leadership roles in a number of NIH and NINDS programs, including co-leading the NIH's Brain Initiative, the Recover Initiative, in the study of post-acute squalae of COVID-19. We're so honored to have him with us today to help us better understand long COVID. Dr. Korshitz. Well, thank you very much, Catherine. It's a pleasure to be here. And I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about um, what we know and probably more about what we don't know about this condition. Um, and uh, we use the term post-acute sequelae of COVID as an umbrella term uh, to uh, cover all the things that are happened to people because they had COVID in the past. So this would include things such as long COVID, which is what you hear about in the newspapers, um, a condition, a post-viral condition, people do not get better from their acute infection, but it also uh, would include things like uh, any change to one's risk of developing, say, diabetes, heart disease, dementia, or stroke going on in the future. So that's the term we use, post-acute sequelae of COVID, as an umbrella term. Have the next slide, please. I'm going to talk talking about the issue of long COVID, which are these persistent symptoms that occur usually during the infection and then don't get better. Sometimes they get a little better and then they and then they plateau, um, but they can last uh, for long periods of time. We're not exactly sure how long they can actually last going out, but certainly there are people who've been affected now for over a year, or sometimes up to two years now. So these symptoms of long COVID are really a cacophony of a whole bunch of different things. They usually occur in clusters. Most people have multiple symptoms, average seven to 13 symptoms, and they fall into these major areas. So there are some that we call neurologic. Um, these are most, most troubling or difficulties with the rapidity of your thinking processes moving from one um, uh, mental activity to another very quickly um, uh, goes under the name brain fog. There is no such thing as fog in the brain, but as it's this kind of sense that everything is slowed down and everything is harder to do, uh, but there's no loss of function. Like you don't lose your speech, you don't lose your memory, just everything is slower, more difficult. Attention is a problem. Um, and then um, headache is, is another big problem. Sleep disorder is a big problem. There are also uh, problems with mobility. So most of the people with long COVID have this sense of fatigue, which we all understand. We've all been fatigued either due to sleeplessness or as I say during a, you know, a common cold with a fever. Uh, so fatigue is very prominent in, the, in this symptom cluster, um, and that limits people's activities. Um, there are also some people who have difficulty with their pulmonary system. Most of these people are people who had infection in the lungs, so they have persistent cough, persistent shortness of breath. Um, some of them have abnormalities on their scans, but many of their pulmonary functions seem to have been uh, normalized, but they're still having these symptoms of shortness of breath, cough, uh, uh, when, particularly when they exercise. Um, there are some people who develop what we call postural orthostatic tachycardia with palpitations um, uh, and a discomfort in their chest. Uh, next slide. That's not all, unfortunately. There's a whole bunch of other symptoms that can occur. Some of them are related to the GI system, abdominal pain, uh, decreased appetite, uh, a whole bunch of different uh, GI disorders, and then general symptoms like uh, feeling muscle pain, uh, different types of pain syndromes. We mentioned that in the chest. Some people will develop a painful neuropathy, uh, flu-like symptoms, fever, less common, uh, fatigue we talked about. And then, uh, you know, if, if you have, if you had COVID, we know what the consequences of COVID are. Um, certainly that creates a lot of anxiety. And if you're not getting better after COVID, that's going to create even more anxiety. It's not an anxiety disorder primarily, but secondarily, uh, COVID can create an anxiety disorder. 
particularly if you have all these other symptoms thrown in and you're really worried about when am I going to be better? When am I going to be back to normal again? And weeks and months go by. So anxiety, depression uh, also um, are going to be pretty common in this population. Uh, next slide. So uh, how many people are developing this? Well, this is a hard question because it depends a little bit of how you ask the question and what kind of data you acquire to get your answer. Um, uh, but this is a, a global look around the world at uh, the getting a, a best estimate of the prevalence of uh, post-acute sequelae of COVID. And you can see here that in uh, younger folks, it's pretty uncommon, you know, a couple percent here and there. Um, in men age greater than 20, uh, the percentages go up, and these are the different symptoms that people are feeling. Um, greater than one symptom cluster is in the orange. Fatigue is that dark blue, which is pr which is pretty common. Respiratory is that brown. And you can see that women in general, and most of the studies show a slight predominance, this one probably more so than I've seen in other studies, of these persistent symptoms. Now of interest in this in this study, and I don't exact cannot exactly figure out how they where they got the data to, to get at this, but they tried to estimate the duration. And they estimated it as nine months for those who are hospitalized and four months for those who are non-hospitalized. And certainly if you talk to physicians who are taking care of folks who are suffering from these conditions, most see that there are most of the patients are getting better over time, although uh, some have plateaued and, and seem to have kind of stagnated. Nobody really keeps getting worse though, so it's not a it's not like creating a new disease that gets worse and worse over time. It's either plateauing or getting better is what we've seen so far. Uh, but the knowledge is incomplete. Next slide. Now, the best evidence that getting at the prevalence and incidence is really comes out of the UK data. They have a national healthcare system, so they can get data and, they, and they've done these surveys which, uh, and, and just to give you an example of what the issues are in, in getting at the numbers. If you just look at the number of people who have persistent symptoms of in that class we talked about, 12 weeks, so this is you know three months after the acute infection, um, it's 11.7% based on self-classification. So if you just ask people, um, about 11.7% will say yes. Um, if you take at, if you take the symptoms and you ask people, do you have any of these specific symptoms, you get about 5% of people reporting any of the 12 common symptoms that we saw in the previous slides. However, if you ask people who didn't get COVID, if they have those symptoms, the prevalence is 3.4%. And that is the key thing to know is that the symptoms of post-COVID are not specific to post-COVID. They occur very commonly in the population. The best estimate is you ask people if they have had these symptoms continuously over a period of at least 12 weeks. So in the common population, people have these symptoms at any point in time, but they're less frequently going to cover a period of three months, particularly those three months after you got COVID. That gets you more specificity and gets you about 3% of the people who had COVID versus only 0.5% in, in a control group. Um, so that's why the difficulty there is, in, and then you'll see these big differences in estimates. But I think this is probably the best data from the UK, which says about 3% of people really have this post-viral syndrome we call long COVID. Next slide. A couple of things about how the infection has changed. It's changed because the variants have changed, and it's changed because people are now being vaccinated. And certainly vaccination seems to, in many studies, shows about a 50% lowering risk of developing post-acute sequelae COVID. So it's another good reason to get vaccinated. Um, in terms of the variants, um, the thing to know is that the Delta variant was the one that got people into hospitals into, on ventilators. All those people are gonna have long recovery periods with all these symptoms, and they're gonna go on for a year, probably more than a year. Um, that's less common now with the, with the, uh, with the Omicron variant, but unfortunately with Omicron, there is still a significant percentage of people if they're not vaccinated 
Uh, and even if they are vaccinated, some will develop uh, these symptoms. Uh, and again, this is not the most conservative way of approximating, but you can kind of see the differences whether you're vaccinated or not, Omicron versus Delta. Uh, next slide. Um, I think we'll skip that one, go to the next one. And uh, so, so the big question is what's causing this the problem? The problem is we don't know the answer to that. Um, I would say that this is not the first time we've seen this. There are many other uh, uh, infectious conditions where there are some people who develop persistent symptoms and don't get better. Um, you may know that this is not uncommon and people get Lyme disease. Epstein-Barr virus, infectious mononucleosis, a number of other viral diseases, some less common. Um, and there is this condition called myalgic encephalomyelitis, chronic fatigue syndrome, abbreviated as MECFS. And those people generally say that their problems started after what sound like some kind of infectious illness. Not everyone, but the larger proportion of people with MECFS do give that history. Um, and then they have symptoms that go on, unfortunately, for years or decades, and that can be a very severe disease. So that's the big worry is that post-COVID may some proportion of people, maybe a small proportion, hopefully, maybe we can even stop it, to stop it at any cost, but going on to develop MECFS would be a real problem for the country, uh, given the millions of people who have been infected with COVID uh, and the people who develop post-COVID. Now, what's causing it? There's a couple of theories, but we don't really have good evidence. One is that there's actually persistent virus in the body. So certain viruses, Epstein-Barr virus is a good example. Uh, once you get it, it's, you always have it. It's hiding in different cells in your body. It usually doesn't cause trouble, uh, but it is persistent. Uh, herpes viruses, uh, you know, cold sores, uh, herpes zoster, that's that's zoster that's reactivated, you know, years and years after you had chickenpox. So viruses can stay latent and they may, in some instances, be active enough to cause the immune system to still go after them, which would potentially cause these symptoms. Um, the other thing is there could be viral particles or pieces of viruses that are still in your membranes and they're slowly leaking out and there's still an immune response, even though there's no active virus. The other possibility is that you developed autoantibodies due to the COVID infection. There's an antibody response. When you have a big antibody response, sometimes it overspills and the antibodies start to recognize normal proteins as viral proteins, and then they'll continuously be reacting against these uh, normal proteins. And a lot of autoimmune diseases are, are due to these autoantibodies. So rheumatoid arthritis, a good example, systemic lupus, another example of an autoimmune disorder where antibodies are reacting against your body. And people with those disorders have a lot of the symptoms that people with long COVID have because your immune system is hyperactivated. Um, there could be damage to the tissues, particularly in people who have the lung problems that the infection caused damage, but there could be damage in other tissues as well that are taking time to get over. And, and there could be reactivation of other viruses besides uh, COVID, like Epstein-Barr virus. So those are the main theories. We really haven't been able to nail down which of these is the real culprit, and, and it potentially could be different in different people. Uh, next slide. Uh, I'm just going to skim through these. So there have been studies, and there are inklings uh, for, for each of these theories. So here you can see in blue, um, these are the controls. In red are the people who have long COVID. And these are the different inflammatory markers. And you can see there's maybe some differences, but a lot of overlap. So it's it's not nothing definitive yet. Uh, so this was looking at continued immune dysregulation. Uh, some evidence, but not definitive. Next slide. Uh, uh, this is uh, just studies that looked at autoantibodies. So when you have COVID, you do develop a lot of autoantibodies. We don't, we don't know is whether they are now related to the post-COVID syndrome. But we do know that you do develop autoantibodies when you're infected with COVID. Next slide. Um, and this is just an example of the vascular changes that occur in COVID. Um, and that some studies show some evidence that, that some of these vascular abnormalities are persisting in people with post-COVID. Uh, as you know, the virus affects 
uh, cells that have this particular receptacle, the ACE2 receptor, and that is on the lining cells of blood vessels, and that caused a lot of trouble with clotting in the acute COVID. And so some suggestions that maybe continued trouble with the vascular system, even in the post-COVID state. Next slide. But again, not clearly uh, connected to the symptom. And then there are some papers, mostly from animals experiments and maybe some acute COVID brain tissue that uh, COVID uh, can affect the inflammatory processes in the brain. Uh, we don't, this is still on the experimental side, we don't have good evidence that this occurs in long COVID, but it's another potential trouble that might affect brain function. Although I must say that um, there are many ways where your inflamed system can get uh, can get uh, geared up and cause all these symptoms without actually, you know, causing something happening in the brain. It's these circulating factors that go to the brain and cause trouble with concentration, memory, and sleep, and things like that. Next slide. Um, okay. Um, there is a, a one paper which is in press that is claiming to see uh, active virus in people who have died months after COVID. So that's it's not published yet. Uh, so it's still not peer reviewed finish, but that's a big question of whether there's some continued viral activity in people with post COVID. Uh, again, not clear that this is occurring in people who, you know, completely recovered as well as people who have post-COVID, but there may be some evidence of continued virus uh, activation months after COVID. Next slide. Another study still not published as far as I know, looking at signs of the viral protein circulating in these little particles called exosomes in people who have post-COVID. Um, now, some of them have also been seen in people who, have, who don't have the post-COVID, so but more commonly in this study, people had long COVID. So these are the kind of things we're tracking. Next slide. And the way we're doing this is through this study called Recover, which is a large NIH study. It's recruited over 10,000 people. Uh, and uh, uh, we are trying to try and get at these potential different causes. Uh, we're looking at different conglomeration of symptoms and we're trying to develop clinical trials uh, to try and treat the symptoms, uh, but also clinical trials of things like antivirals on the chance that there is still viral activation. Uh, so I'm getting short of time, so I'm just going to run through the next couple of slides very quickly, but I think I hit the high points here. Next slide. Uh, this is just uh, progress in the study over time. Uh, lots of work going on all across the country, not just in the patients that I talked about, but also in autopsy studies, electronic health record studies, and people trying to look at the biology on this lying long COVID. Next slide. Um, and preliminary findings from the electronic health records looking at uh, the incidence in people uh, in, uh, in recent times with these people who have a symptom, eight to 20% uh, in the non in the hospitalized and four to eight percent and the non-hospitalized is what this report came out as. Next slide. Um, and when we go, these are the main things I think I talked about, that the higher peaks were in the early part of the pandemic. Vaccination decreases your risk. And um, uh, next slide. And these are the trials that we're focusing on different symptoms, uh, whether they be the autonomic, the cardiopulmonary, the sleep, or the neurologic, going after antivirals for viral assistance, and then things that would alter immune dysregulation. Next slide. And good, I think that's it. I hope uh, that was kind of a quick overview of where we stand now in terms of the numbers and the work that's being done to try and understand this, but still so much to learn. So thanks very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Korshitz, for sharing this update on the current state of the research and also an update on the Recover Initiative.